All right, hello everyone and welcome to this month's capacity building webinar series. We are um, doing this on a completely different day than we normally do. Uh, the voice you are hearing is April Reardon. I am the capacity building director at Habitat Minnesota. I am recovering from the flu and an upper respiratory infection. And so I'll say that up front that I do hope that I spare you any sniffling and coughing during this webinar, but I can't guarantee it. Um, that said, too, I do hope that those of you who are on a headset or on the phone, um, that you will jump in and share your comments and your stories, if for no other reason than to give me my voice a little break as we talk about this exciting new study. Uh, so we today are just taking a look at the results from the impacts of Habitat for Humanity homeownership study uh, that Habitat Minnesota recently got the results from, from our work with Wilder Research. Um, but just a little bit, the Capacity Building Webinar Series, this is a monthly web conference that Habitat Minnesota hosts for our affiliates. And sometimes we have some neighboring uh, affiliates from neighboring states who jump in and participate with us too, and they are always welcome. Um, typically, the web conferences are the last Wednesday of each month. This month, that happens to fall right during the National Habitat Conference in Atlanta. So. Uh, we decided to do it a little bit earlier this month. Also wanted to be able to have an opportunity to talk about these results before um, people head to that conference in case you have questions. Um, I will share the slides um, and other resources via email after the web conference, but I'll also share them on, we have a, a web page that devoted to the homeowner impact study. And so I will, um, I'll show you that page in just a moment. Anyway, but speaking of participating today, um, many of you have participated in our webinars in the past and know all of this, but in case we have somebody new, um, just know everyone right now is muted. Um, and that's just for sound quality to, to cut down on any background noise or if you're typing or in a noisy area. Um, but if you would like to uh, talk with us, so like I said, if you have a, a microphone built into your computer, if you have a headset on, if you're on the phone, you just raise your hand. There's a little hand in your control panel that you click on. I'll see that and, um, and you know, as soon as I can, then I can unmute you and you can talk with us, make comments, share stories, ask questions. You can also use that control panel, the question area, to type in any comments or questions. I'll also be on the lookout for those and we'll share those um, with the group when appropriate. So I do hope that we will have um, an interactive session and excited to hear your, um, your questions, your comments, your takeaways from the study. So I was just going to show you then too, before we go too much into the study, here is where on the Habitat for Humanity of Minnesota website, if you are looking to find uh, information about the homeownership impact study, this is, I'll show you what's here now. And we'll also be adding more resources and tools for affiliates to this page as well. So if you were to come to our homepage, you want to go for four affiliates, and it's actually at data for affiliates. So this is where you would find then information about the homeownership impact study, but then also our, our UFTA reports. And so then you'd click here. You can download the full, the full study here. This is just the little overview of some of the, the, the highlights. This is where you could have registered for today's webinar. Um, what's really nice here is that you can have the full study and then there's PDFs here of just the different sections as well. So depending on who you might be sharing this information with, sometimes it's nice to just go peek at one section. Um, we'll also be adding, this is where I'll, I'll provide a link to some slides that you're, you're welcome to download and, and borrow if you're doing a presentation in your, in your home community. So you can start with those slides. Um, we will add, um, we are working with a designer on a, 
a nice brochure about the homeowner impact study. So we'll we'll have a an electronic version that you can download here. Um, and maybe at the end, Kristen, if you um, think of other things, Kristen, our communications manager that she wants to mention that are sort of in the hopper, we'll, we'll put those up here then too. But just so you know where to find all of that information on our website and to know that we'll continue to add other things, including uh, if, our, if affiliates have good examples of ways that they have used the study, um, we can certainly share those examples here too. So back over here. Today, we just want to do a high level review of um, about the study. We know that you're incredibly busy and you may not have time to sit down with an 80 page document and read all the details. So we want to make sure to use this webinar as just a nice way to prevent some, present some of the highlights and um, field some questions. I may not know all of the answers if you have really technical questions, but we can certainly um, get back to you with, with some of those if we um, talk to the folks at Wilder Research. Somehow that just bumped way forward. Okay, so anyway, Wilder Research is who we worked with to complete this study. This is based on our 2011 pilot study that we did with the help of an evaluation VISTA here at Habitat Minnesota. Um, one of the evaluation VISTAs who worked on the pilot study was Maddie Hansen. And um, in a fun turn of events, she works for Wilder Research now and also worked on this study. So um, many of you will see her uh, next month at the Oli Conference. Um, but Wilder recommended a phone interview process. And so as many of you um, who are listening in from affiliates know, um, you shared your homeowner lists with us. And then Wilder did a um, pulled a sample of homeowners, so that was representative of all of our homeowners across Minnesota, and ultimately were successful in conducting 402 phone interviews. Uh, the study really wanted to look at um, how can we measure the impact of Habitat for Humanity beyond just the number of homes we build um, or the number of families served. And so it's really looking at the connection between Habitat homeownership and all of these different areas of that that suggest a quality of life. So we'll look at safety, health, then education, um, the social connectedness, which is the connected feeling connected to your community and that sort of sense of belonging. Um, you know, family interaction and personal well-being is just, you know, is my family getting along better? Are we happier? Are those relationships stronger? And then the personal well-being is just I feel better about myself. Some of that self-esteem or this this feeling of, of having hope for the future. Uh, and then the economic situation as well. Um, the way that we, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about how will we analyze this data? You know, it would be wonderful if we had a huge samples that um, each affiliate could download their results. But um, with 2,200 homeowners total and 402 interviews, that's really not possible um, just because of the small samples. But um, but we did analyze, um, or while the research analyzed by northern Minnesota, southern Minnesota, and Twin Cities area. Um, oftentimes, when we go to look at the results, we'll just see greater Minnesota and Twin Cities results, some of those comparisons. Um, we just weren't sure going into it if we, there would be much of a, you know, a difference. Um, there was a little bit of nervousness about we the pilot study had included seven affiliates and did not include the metro area. And we wondered, boy, are we still going to get these great results that show that Habitat really does do more than just build homes. It also builds that hope and builds community. Um, you know, so we'll see that. So the only times that the study notes the difference between northern and southern Minnesota is if there was a more than a 10% difference. That's what we considered statistically significant was to show that. Um, every now and then we'll point out one of those here as we review the results, but um, your guess is as good as mine as to how those are, are different. And that's one of the things that will be kind of fun to speculate and have you talk about. Um, we also looked at um, by length of residence. So those Habitat homeowners who'd been in their homes less than five years and those who had been in their homes more than five years. And so there are a couple places where that becomes significant. Um, all right. So of those 402 uh, 
homeowners who participated in the study. Uh, here's some of, the, some of the data that I just pulled from them. Again, if you go here and look at the full study, um, it could break down some of those homeowner characteristics in much more detail. You can see a map of what was considered a northern Minnesota affiliate, what was considered southern Minnesota. And um, if there are questions about that, we can sure look at that. Why does that keep doing that? Sorry. Um, so 55%, you know, about half and half have lived in their home more than five years. Um, the others were, were less than five years, so we had a good mix there. 98% um, of those homeowners have children. I mean, some of this is as to be expected. I think I, I was a little surprised at just how high that number was. Um, I think we, we were interested in wondering how many um, single moms might be in the, in the study. But anyway, 70% of the respondents were female. In the Twin Cities, that was a little bit lower than in greater Minnesota. And you can see some of the race, race and ethnicity information by region. Um, so here's the overall column. Um, Northern Minnesota, maybe not surprisingly, had a larger American Indian population. Southern Minnesota um, had more of an African Native and Latino population than the Northern Minnesota. Uh, and Twin Cities, they're the largest group of respondents were African Native and second largest were Black or African American. So it's just really an interesting mix to look at how that, that plays out and that's some good data to, to think about. I keep looking to see if any hands are raised or if we have questions yet. But um, So overall, what we were delighted to find out after um, surveying statewide was that 92% of homeowners said their lives were better. Um, the piece when I asked Paul Matesik, the executive director of Wilder Research, and he was also the lead researcher on this project, what stood out for him? Um, you know, what did he think was unique about this? Or was there anything that he was particularly surprised by. And what he said is it was this, it was really this piece in that oftentimes they can do studies and there might be a positive response or a positive correlation between a particular program and the, the, and the, the recipient of the program of their outcomes. But the fact that so, such a huge percentage of our homeowners not only said their lives were better, but, but, clearly said that they attribute that positive change either completely or a lot to Habitat for Humanity. So there is something about the process of homeownership, about this habit, the way Habitat works, that is really having that impact and getting, getting those results. Um, throughout the study, there are, you know, the beauty of doing the phone interviews is that we are able to capture so many wonderful testimonials and quotes. And so, um, you know, we'll continue to be able to use those. But, um, you know, so it was it was great. We weren't sure if that number would go down from the pilot study, if we included everyone. But um, if you dig into the study a little bit more, I think um, if you're wondering who, what about the other 8% who said their lives were not better, I think there was a good chunk of them who said they were about the same. And then the, the might be 1% that said their, their life was worse, um, which we were joking in a staff meeting that um, about whether the news would pick up this story, you know, local news or anything like that about um, the impact of habitat homeownership and, and, Sadly, ironically, we think if it was 92% of homeowners said their lives were worse, then it would make the news. This is just sort of what everyone expects from Habitat and probably thinks, wow, you studied that? Obviously, their lives are better. But um, So that was great. That's really good news. Uh, so then in some of these other sections, um, we did confirm, the study confirms that homeowners do feel safe. They feel um, safe in their homes. Um, there were just questions and we didn't distinguish. One of the things that we discussed in our um, staff conversations was 
sort of our own perception of what safety meant or what we thought people might be responding to. And so some people in their testimonials were quest talking about just physical safety of their home, sort of, um, I don't have to deal with mold anymore or um, dangerous wiring or, or things like that. And others might have been more focused on the safety of their neighborhood or the safety around their house. And so this particular quote just captures a little bit of both of that, that that, that it wasn't open-ended and it was really about um, homeowner's perception of what safety meant to them. But 90% feel more safe in their homes, 80% felt safer than they were in their previous homes. And it was a similar percentage about their children's safety. Uh, and interestingly enough, it was relatively similar across all regions, greater Minnesota and in the Twin Cities, about that sense of safety. So, um, but this quote, just before we were living in a drug infested neighborhood in a tiny little house that had been made into a duplex, you know, and so then there's that piece of the safety outside of the home, but also that there had been lead paint and no furnace filter, a hole in the furnace, which would leak. Um, so that's the kinds of changes that people are experiencing because of those habitat homes and with that safety. So regarding health, so along with health um, after safety, then um, we did ask homeowners about improvements in their health. Um, and so there's some other data there, but the big piece that, that we're trying to highlight here is that homeowners do report improvements in respiratory conditions. So first, first off, it would ask um, homeowners who were responding to the survey whether anybody had an, a respiratory illness. So of those who had a family member with respiratory illnesses, 57% said that they improved after moving into their habitat home. So it starts to kind of scrunch and be a smaller sample when you look at those who do have respiratory illnesses. So, um, you know, so 57% said they improved. The piece that then was nice, it's nice that we measured and, and analyzed the length of their residence is this second piece because of those with respiratory illnesses. So shorter term homeowners would be those who'd lived in their homes less than five, five years or less. And so um, the sustainable building program or some of the work that we're doing on um, healthy homes started in 2009. And so the study that, you know, these, the study was being done in 2014. So it's, it's just nice to see then that 74% of those shorter term homeowners noted an improvement in their condition. 47% of longer term homeowners noted that. So it'll be interesting to con continue to see how that work that we're doing with making homes healthier and that, that energy efficiency and, and making sure that they're, they're safe for those people with respiratory illnesses is um, going to be continued to, to see how well that aligns and how much that continues into the future. So that was a great um, outcome to be able to see in particular with those shorter term homeowners. And feel free to, again, raise your hand, type in questions, comments. If you have um, what I'd love to hear, and I'm sure Kristen would love to hear too, is if you have a story to share with us about your own homeowner. So we've got, you know, all of these, this great data now, and to have the stories to go along with it. You've been telling these wonderful, wonderful stories on your own websites and your own events and um, in your materials for a long time. And it's nice to just connect the data to that. So do please raise your hand or type in a comment. So uh, another section, so like we said, 98% of the um, respondents have children. And we were really interested to see what the connection might be between um, st stable housing in having a habitat home and um, children's education. And so, um, you know, Wilder Research when in their executive summary would say that we can confidently say that habitat homeownership does have a positive influence on children's education. Uh, over half of homeowners said their children's grades improved after moving into their habitat home. This is one of those sections where it's probably worth your while to dig into the um, full study a little bit just to see 
um, some of the tables about where, in, and we see a little bit of this on the table um, here on this slide, but just to look at what was the status of their grades before they moved into their habitat home. So if, if, if over half seems a little underwhelming, it's, you know, part of it is that they felt like their children's grades were kind of okay beforehand anyway, so they didn't need improvement. But for those um, families, so if we look here, I think you can see my arrow in the fair and the poor area. So if they, if the habitat homeowners said their student, the, the kind of the worst they were doing before, um, the bigger the impact that it had on, on that improvement in their children's grades and study habits. So this is similar in for study habits as well. You know, so those who were struggling most in their previous housing situation, then having a habitat home impacted that improvement in a higher percentage. You know, so this is a, it's a small group who said their children's grades were, were poor um, before their habitat home, but 100% of those said that they did better, you know, and 46% um said they did much, who said their kids' grades were fair before, 46% much better, plus that 35% of somewhat better, um, that really starts to be a significant impact on that sort of improvement for, for young people. Having been um, my previous career in youth development, knowing that, that was, that's usually the case, that the interventions have the greatest impact on those who are high risk, and, and it's really hard to have that kind of an impact um, on kids who are, who are doing that poorly and to think about the role that stable, stable housing and having a place to study is having their parents more available to them, having a, um, any number of those things that, that are helping them um, do better in school. Um, but two thirds of homeowners feel more confident about their ability to fund their children's college education. All of these different areas that we're looking at start to overlap and you can see um, start to see this trajectory of change that happens because of this stable home, because of all of the things that go along with that. So if you're feeling, if you're healthier, maybe you're you're not missing school as often and you're not getting as sick. Or if you feel safe, then that, that adds a certain level of stability and comfort and, and, and reduces your stress so that you can, can study more. Um, but then we'll see some of these other impacts as well. But um, about that ability to fund college education. And just 90% of homeowners said they feel better about their children's future. And this would be because of my habitat home, I feel better about my children's future. Um, so that's definitely one to be um, sharing with, with all of our stakeholders. Uh, and so this regarding education, the the um the study also asked about adult education as well. And so um again looking at that trajectory of train of change and, and how all of these different areas start to overlap in order to provide this overall improvement in quality of life, um in ninety two percent of the habitat homes. So if we add up those who personally, the homeowners who personally started or completed higher education or training programs, those who plan to start and other adults who either started or completed or planned to start, 92% of the Habitat homes, at least one adult started, completed, or plans to start higher education or training programs after moving in. Which again, you know, maybe that starts to, if you have um, a better job and if you're making more money, maybe then that contributes to feeling more confident about being able to fund your children's college education. Or if you've already explored how to fund it for yourself, that might add to some of that confidence for for being able to do that for your children then as well. And in the study, then there's some more data too about what kinds of higher education or training programs then too in different percentages. So you can look at that um, for your region. And uh, another section then would be um, that we talked about the um, social connectedness. And so homeowners do feel more connected. Um, so 80% of the homeowners reported feeling connected to their com community. And 
you know, more than half said they participate more in community activities. Um, kids are spending more time with their friends and classmates. Um, you know, these are all looking pretty, you know, if you look at this graph, it's pretty similar across all of the regions about how connected they are. Um, if you look at the full study, there are some some differences about how connected or how connected they were before compared to to now. And then I believe that was where in greater Minnesota, maybe they already felt pretty connected to community, um, you know, so that there was still some some of a connection. I know some of our staffs, some of our Habitat Minnesota staff, their favorite quotes come from this section about um, because there are homeowners who really articulate well the impact of having all the volunteers working on the construction of their homes, how well connected that made them feel. They got to meet all of those people. Those people were invested in having creating that home for them. And so um, that has impacted them. Some of them um, are serving on the, the local habitat board or, or serving on committees, that, you know, now that they've been, um, in their habitat home for some time. Um, there was a little bit in the, particularly in the Twin Cities where they might be a little less connected, but that was um, higher amongst shorter term homeowners. Um, so maybe, you know, it could be that they moved to a different community. And um, so there was definitely a link between longer term homeowners were more connected than shorter term homeowners. So that could, that's probably we thought to be expected. Uh, homeownership affects self-esteem uh, and families. So two-thirds of homeowners said they get along better with their families. 70% spend more time with their families. Uh, you know, there are a number of comments from uh, homeowners who said, uh, I don't have to work as much now. Um, maybe my, my housing is more affordable and stable, and so I can spend more time with my family. I'm less stressed. Um, things like that, but 90% of homeowners said they feel at least somewhat better about themselves, and 75% of homeowners feel much better about themselves compared to before becoming a Habitat homer. And just to think about the impact that that has on every aspect of your life, if you're just feeling proud and feeling better about yourself, it would affect your parenting, it affects your confidence about taking on a new job or a new uh, training program. Um, so I just think that's those are some really remarkable outcomes um, of the study. Um, we've had quite a bit of discussion in our office about more than more than fifty percent have more money and pay less for housing, and how um, I think to some that might seem a little underwhelming, or we would have hoped that more, a higher percentage of, of homeowners might have, might report having more money or paying less for housing. Um, but maybe I'll ask some of our participants today to speculate as to um, where some of that comes in or why somebody might feel like they have less money or feel like they're paying more for housing because of their habitat home. You can raise your hand or type in a comment. Anything surprising about this statistic from the study? Giving you a moment. I think one of the, uh, in the Twin Cities, uh, folks were more likely to be paying less for housing, and that might be just um, the differences in the, in the cost of rent. Um, oh, here we go. I'm going to unmute you, John, so you can talk with us. Yeah, it just seems to me that it's very possible that this is just a, a matter of perception. Mm -hmm. People are paying for things 
individually that they didn't have to pay for before. It was all built into their rent costs. And it might seem to someone who's all of a sudden having to pick up the cost of trash, the cost of water, property taxes, that it may seem like they have less money. Um, but I, I think that, you know, if you do the math, it's probably not the case, but it's it might be more about perception. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chad. I'll let you go ahead and unmute yourself, maybe. Any other comments on this one? You could type them in or raise your hand and talk with us. You know, in some cases, the mortgage isn't always isn't always cheaper. Um, I think there was some discussion amongst our staff too, because when we look at <coughs> the decreased use of public assistance on the next slide, that it might be relative to that decrease. So that if you're, um, you know, again, that would play into that perception as well. Um, but the stability, the stable housing and the other benefits are definitely a good trade-off as well for that perception. But still, I do still think that 50% perceiving that they do have more money and that they pay less for housing is 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 very positive. Um, and then this second piece is that in nearly half of Habitat households, someone did change jobs since becoming a homeowner. Um, and of those, 80% said their jobs are better. So again, this sort of trajectory of change and thinking this moment in time when they get home and, and to think about all of the other reverberations that come from that. And that's really what this study is, is trying to tell. And it's something that we have known in our guts and in our hearts for a long time, but it's nice to have the um, data to support that. So the study did um, show a decreased use of government assistance. So that's um, an exciting thing to uh, be able to report. You know, that's popular with with many, um, but so, you know, overall 87% of homeowners before, at the time of their application, so it's at the time that they applied for a Habitat Home, um, were using some form of government assistance. Uh, and then by the time they were doing their phone interview, that percentage had declined by, by 20 points. So um, what Wilder was also able to do, um, because, of Habitat has such great data on our homeowners, they were also able to do a cost benefit analysis. Um, so by looking at the decrease in government assistance um, and some of the, um, all of these impacts, we can look at 2,200 Habitat homeowners. So, and that number was growing all the time. So this number would change um, over time as well. But, you know, on the conservative end of things, and, and this was a pretty conservative calculation anyway, but each year by having these families in Habitat homes, we are saving Minnesota 6.4 on the low end to 9.3 on the high end, but 6.4 to 9.3 million dollars of government assistance every year. Um, so that's just, it, it's just an incredibly powerful thing to think about. And so I know in our, and some of our conversations with affiliates, as, as we've looked at this, we kind of start to sketch out, okay, so 6.4 million divided by the number of homes we build each year or, or, or the cost of a home, what it costs to build a home to think about, um, how we can leverage some of this data to, um, continue to support and 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 get funding for building habitat homes, but thinking about how we can leverage that to do more of the good work um, that we do. Comments or questions at at this point about about the study. Uh, you know, some of our conversations in house with with Habitat Minnesota staff or in talking to others is that. Um, I think if we had had some surprising negative impacts or, um, you know, if we thought our our program was doing something and, and the study told us it really wasn't, you know, that might 
spark some more, you know, controversial discussions, but some of this is, is just so affirming in that, yes, all the things that we kind of thought our program was doing, it, it really is, and it's doing it in a really big way. I'm just going to pause and see if anybody wants to raise a hand or type in a question or a comment, anything that's surprising, anything that you'd like to know more about at this at this point, ways that you're planning to use the study, stories from your homeowners that would support some of this data. Looking for some hands. I should say that this reaction so far is kind of how it's gone here. All right, so we have Frank Gorman from Habitat for Humanity International with the hand raised. Frank, I'm going to unmute you. Good. Can you hear me? I sure can. Good. I thought I needed to give you a break there because you've, you've been doing a lot of talking <laughs> there. So anyway, anyway uh, but I, I think it is great data here. and I, you know, We've spent a lot of time over the last few months, and I know folks that might have attended Habitat on the Hill, kind of always looking for this data to continue to advocate for the great work that we do. And I think this particular one about the decreased use of government assistance could be a very powerful piece of data relative to our advocacy efforts. So, uh, so I just wanted to make a comment about that. And um, I'll follow up with you after the call, April, but I'd like to uh, get this deck from you because I do want to share some of this with uh, our Habitat International staff departments who I think would find this information extremely beneficial to the work they do with working with donors on the advocacy side and our program side. So I want to thank you for taking the time to do this today. Absolutely. Thanks, Frank. <clears throat> Any other comments or, or questions? We will share. So we wanted to put together some slides that were pretty um, kind of generic so that we can share them with everybody and you can um, oops, um, use them in your own presentations uh, you know we can when our brochure from the designer is done that will have more of a um, personal feel to it we're getting some permission from from all of you to use some photos of your homeowners but then um, I think that'll be a nice companion piece to the slides um, We'll also be doing a session at the OLE conference to help you think about how do I use and tell the story of kind of mix this data with um, those pieces. And let's see, Kristen has some comments about some other thing, ways, things, ways that we can support you in sharing this data with your um, local communities. Go ahead, Kristen. Sure. Thanks, April. Um, I just wanted to say just um, a couple things. We've been putting together some um, posts on social media, um, and I've kind of found that the combination of maybe a great family photo that you have with some of the quotes or some of the stats from um, the report is kind of an easy way to get this out there, um, especially those image-based um, posts. So, I mean, I've seen some people sharing what we do, um, and I'll certainly be doing more. But uh, you all have photos of your own families, so if you want to combine those with some of the good stats we saw, that's kind of a quick, easy way to get some of this information out there and to make it um, digestible for people in kind of small bits. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is if any of you are um, interested in having me um, send you kind of a media release, um, I know it's, it's not necessarily hard-hitting brand new news, but if, um, if you've got a good relationship with a local newspaper or something, let me know um, and we can work together to get something catered specifically for your affiliate. Um, I have kind of a template, but it probably makes more sense to have it more specific to your area. Um, and especially if you have any events coming up, something um, in combination with an event could be a good way to do um, a media release for this. I know the Twin Cities affiliate had an event uh, a week or two ago with their um, – it was a kind of a reunion for their homeowners, so they were um, kind of putting some – um, releases out or contacting some of their um, press contacts um, just to say, hey, this new study came out, also we're having this event, and if you, 
you know, send someone out, you'll be able to get some great photos of families as well. So just kind of some things to be thinking about. Um, and if you have ideas of ways to share this um, that we can pass along to other affiliates, just let me know and I, I can kind of help be the go-between there. So um, that's kind of all I wanted to mention unless anyone has questions for me about any of that. No, that's great. Thanks, Kristen. So we'll continue to add things to this this page, but you can feel free to contact me, contact Kristen if you're interested in some of those things. Um, you know, we're happy to come. You know, if you don't want to present the data yourself, we're happy to come and, and do things like that for you too. Um, and if you think of other things that would be helpful in telling this story, that would be great um, as well. Um, any other questions or comments? It's okay to end early. It's fine. We might demonstrate a little bit of how how you might um, present some of this information. Um, but I would think, you know, with the slide deck, what would, you know, if you add some photos from your own homeowners or your own, that would personalize it a little bit for your um, for your own audiences. But I think the data is really resonating powerfully with um, with those who are, are hearing it. We did um, get it out to our the Homes for All Coalition here in Minnesota. Um, and I know in May of, of this year, Habitat World is planning to um, feature the study results as well. So look for that there. Okay, if there are no other comments or questions, maybe we can leave with just looking at this person's comment about just, again, reviewing that 92% of homeowners said their lives were better, and 89% said that they attribute that positive change either completely or a lot to habitat. Um, you know, this person says, yeah, it changed my life 100%. Um, and that they are happy when they live in their house. So feel great about the work that you are doing. Please do share this information with your stakeholders and, and do let us know how we can help you do that even better. All right. Thanks, everybody.